up here, then. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mother. Uh, have you got your ticket? Well, I thought you'd have got that. All right. Wait here. see the house. Oh. Angela says she spent the whole week spring cleaning to make it nice for you. I'm sure she needn't put herself out for me. Angela's coming to meet us in the car. Well, she drives, does she? She does. Most women do nowadays. Eileen doesn't. No. Doesn't look as if she's bothered. The train was a couple of minutes early. Three minutes late. Well, it's not far, is it? I expect there'll be a taxi in a minute. I can walk. I'm used to walking, you know. Can't think what's happened to Angela. I expect she was too busy. Eileen came in to see me this morning. Surprised you two don't live together. Oh, yes. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't have to keep a roof over her head then. <laughs> Cut off out here, isn't it? We like it. Eileen said to give you her laugh. Look, I hope you're not going to talk about Eileen the whole weekend in front of Angela. Is this it? This is it. Angela? I think she's got to. Um, I'll go and check to see if the car's in the garage. And why don't you go upstairs and see your room? It's the big one on the right. down somewhere. What's the matter? I'm in an accident. You must go out and see for yourself. She's dead, sir.
Phone the police, Mother. Your wife lived here alone during the week, did you, Mr. Hathaway? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I used to work in Tuxborough. When I got the job in London, I couldn't travel up and down every day. That was in July. Uh, I stay with my mother during the week and come, come home at weekends. So you hadn't seen your wife since when? Last Sunday, Monday? Uh, Sunday night. I went to London by train on Sunday night. Uh, Angela drove me to the station. I talked to her every day on the phone. I talked to her today at lunchtime. Who would want to do this? Who would want to kill Angela? Well, that's what we're here to find out, sir. You and your mother arrived here at about 7.30, is that right? 20 past. Thank you. Whereabouts in London do you work, sir? Um, Marcus Flowers, a public relations consultant, Half Moon Street. And what do you do there? I'm, I'm, a, I'm an accountant. Uh, you can check with them. I, I was, uh, I was there all day. Now, don't give way, son. Bed it like a man. I understand that your car is missing. Yes, it, it was. Uh, it was gone from the garage when uh, when we arrived. We'll have to have a description of the car uh, and its number. Sergeant Martin will take the details. Is there any way that you can spend the night? I don't imagine you want to stay here. No, I shall be all right here. You sure? Mm. I shall be here. Yes. She went out in the car and brought somebody back with her. The chances are they went in by the kitchen door. We should be very lucky to find anybody who saw them. The only house is on the Stratton Road. The only other place is Wool Farm, and that's three quarters of a mile away. See you tomorrow? Yep. Well, fine goes our weekend. Uh, Berry Cottage. Berry Cottage? Where's that? Well, Lane. I think I've lost weight. Weigh yourself and see. I don't trust those scales. A man called Hathor lives there. Oh. His wife was murdered this afternoon. Oh, dear. Is it going to be straightforward? Don't know yet. I wondered if you'd come across them. The only person I've ever come across from Wool Lane is that, that Mrs. Lake. She came to the Women's Institute a couple of times, but I think her mind was on other things. Very much a one for the men, you know. So the uh, Women's Institute drummed her out, did they? <laughs> Don't be silly, darling. We're not narrow-minded. She is a widow, after all. I can't think why she hasn't married again. Well, perhaps she's like George II. Not at all. It's very pretty. <laughs> I didn't mean in looks. George II promised his wife on her deathbed that he wouldn't get married again. He'd just take mistresses. Well, stop preening yourself. I'm not dead yet. Yeah, well, what woman would look at me? I have no doubt you have your own idea as to how uh, an inquiry like this should be conducted, Mr. Hathorne. You may think my methods unorthodox, but I assure you that they're my methods and they get results. So if you will answer my questions simply and realistically, we shall get on a lot quicker. You've got no right. But if right. you keep on taking offence and insisting that certain matters concern only your private life and refusing to disclose them, we shall waste a good deal of precious time. Do you understand me? I don't and will see... you be caught? I don't see what right you've got to impugn my wife's moral character. The great majority of people who give lifts to hitchhikers 
have no other thought in their minds but to be helpful, Mr. Hathaway. Look, obviously, someone broke in. Now, he must have left traces of something, traces, uh, footmarks, uh, hair, fingerprints. What do you think my men were doing all over your house last night? But we can't find a hair or a fingerprint at midnight and tell you whose it is nine hours later. Well, when will you be able to? Certainly by later today I shall have some idea as to whether a stranger entered Berry Cottage yesterday yes, afternoon. A stranger broke into Berry Cottage yesterday afternoon. I could have told you that at half past eight last night. A pathological killer broke in. Nobody broke in, Mr. Hathol. There's been no break in. How did they get in? Either a door was open or somebody let them in. Angela was here alone. She wouldn't let them in. Look. Look, somebody broke into the house, he, he murdered my wife, and, 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 and he stole my car to, to make his getaway. Now, have you found that yet? I don't know. I am not God, nor do I have second sight. Now, if you will answer the one question I've put to you, I'll leave you for a while and go and talk to your mother. Oh, my mother knows nothing about it. My mother didn't set foot in the place until half past seven last night. My question, Mr. Hathall. No, my wife is not in the habit of giving lifts. I was the only one she could trust. And no wonder, after what she'd been through. I worshipped my wife. And the only reason I left her here alone during the week because, was because I couldn't face the journey up and down to London every day. Now look what happened. Angela couldn't stand being here alone. I said to her, I said, I said, look, it won't be for much longer, and, and please, stick it, stick it for my sake. Well, it wasn't for much longer, was it? I wonder if I might ask you a few questions while you work with yourself. It's no good asking me. I don't know what she got up to while it was away. I understand that your daughter-in-law was shy and lonely. Oh, she didn't impress you that way. Couldn't say. I only saw her once. But they've been married three years. Yes, well, got the beds to make. Wait a minute. What? Your daughter-in-law's been murdered, Mrs. Hathaway. Well, you don't have to tell me that I found her. Yes. How was that exactly? I've already told them all about that. You do realise you'll have to answer questions at the inquest. And I must tell you, there are serious penalties for obstructing the police. I should never have come here. I said I'd never set foot in the place. I should have stuck to it. Well, why did you come? Because my son insisted. He wanted... He wanted things patched up. But I'll tell you one thing. If that Angela was nervy, it was shame that did it. Shame at breaking up his marriage. And so she should have been ashamed, ruining people's lives. Three lives she ruined. I'll say that at your inquest. I don't mind telling anyone that. I doubt if you'll be asked. I'm asking you about last night. I've got nothing to hide. It's him I'm thinking about, having everything dragged out in the open. She was supposed to meet us at the station. Didn't bother to turn up. She was dead, Mrs. Hathaway. better for you to uh, talk to me in different surroundings. So come down to the police station at uh, about three o'clock, sir. Ask for me. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I lost my temper just now. That's all right. Only natural.
Was that the telegraph? Yes. Let's have a look. We've done one again, Mike. Well, I've only just started. I don't know why you bother, Mike. It's good training for the mind. Ah, there it is. Angela Hathall, 36, was last night found dead in her home in Wool Lane, Kings Markham. She'd been strangled. The police are treating the case as murder. I don't know, Mike. If Dora had been murdered, the last thing I'd want to do is to read about it in the papers. Yet I found Hathall scanning it very intently. A bit gruesome, isn't it? I sometimes think if people were more like you and me, the world might be a better place. Oh, yeah. Anything from the fingerprint, boys, yet? Yes, it's all here. Hathall's dead keen on prints. He's one of those who thinks that if we find a print or a footmark, we'll put our noses to the ground and we run our quarry down about two hours later. Oh, wish it was true. Breathe along, will you? There are one or two points of interest, actually. Not that we're going to run the fox to earth in two hours or anything like it. Did we ever? Any sign of the car yet? Probably turn up in Glasgow or somewhere in the middle of next week. Oh, Marty's been out of that company that Hathor worked at, Marcus Flower, attractive his secretary down at home. Her name's Linda Kipling, and she says that Hathor was there all day yesterday. Came in about 10, and apart from an hour off for lunch, he was there till he left at 5.30. Sit down, Mike. Condense it for me, will you? I'll look at it later. Well, the main thing to note, I'd say, is that there were hardly any prints at all. As far as Hathol's concerned, there was one whole handprint on the front door and then prints on some of the other doors and on the banisters, but they were obviously made after he got in last night. And the wife's prints were only on the bedroom door and on various jars and bottles on the dressing table. Now, it's odd, really. She must have only just cleaned the place very thoroughly indeed, used rubber gloves to do it. And if she took them off, then wiped everything again afterwards. Sounds bloody obsessional to me. But then I suppose some women are like that. Now, there were some prints that they can't account for. Those of one unknown man and one unknown woman. The man's were on some books in the sitting room and on the inside of a cupboard in the spare bedroom. Inside? Yes, so the inside of the door, that is. What about the woman's? Well, that's rather strange, too. There was just one single print. A whole hand print, the right hand, very clear, with a small L-shaped scar on the forefinger. And where was it? On the edge of the bath. It's odd. Anything else? Uh, yes, one thing more. There were some long, coarse, dark hairs, three of them, on the bathroom floor. And they're not Angela's. Hers were finer. Anna or a woman's? They can't tell. And that's about all, I think. We shan't get anything from the post-mortem till tonight, I'm afraid. Right. We have to find that car. We have to find someone who saw her go out in it. And someone, let's hope, who saw her and whoever she picked up come back in it. If that's the way it was. And then we have to find her friends. I can't believe she didn't have any friends. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could help me. My name's Nancy Lake. I'd like to speak to a policeman at the top one. Somebody very important. Are you important? Well, I dare say I'll do. Yes, I really think you might. However, we must be serious. I've come to tell you that I think I was the last person to see Angela Hathel alive. Come in, Mrs. Lake. Thank you. What a nice room. I always thought police stations were brown and murky, with photographs of great brutes wanted for robbing banks all over the walls. This is lovely. A nice view, too. May I s sit down? You live in Sunnybank, I believe. Yes. I always think it sounds like a mental hospital. But my late husband chose the name, and I'm sure he had his reasons. I went there uh, this morning, but you weren't in. Oh, dear. Should I have been? Oh, no. <laughs> of course not. I just wanted to ask you if you were a friend of Mrs. Angela Hathorne's. Oh, no. That's the peculiar thing. We've been neighbours for three years, and this was the first time she'd ever offered me so much as a cup of coffee. How did she ask you? She just said, would you like to come in for a coffee? Just like that. A boat from the blue. She wasn't a very gracious person, you know. I don't know. I hope you tell me. I thought at the time that she'd only asked me in to show me how nice the house looked. Oh, 
didn't it always look nice? Oh, no. Not, not that I care. I'm not much for housework myself, but, um... Angela's house was usually a bit of a pigsty. She said she'd only cleaned it to impress Robert's mother. Did she tell you that she was, uh, expecting another caller? No. She said she was going out in the car, but, um, she didn't say where. And what time did you leave? It must have been just before 12. I was only in the house 10 minutes. And you didn't see her leave Berry Cottage or return to it later? No. I was in Myringham all afternoon and part of the evening. Tell me, what sort of a person was Angela Hathor? Tough, brusque, ungracious. Perhaps that's why she and Robert got on so well together. Did they? Oh, they were a happy couple. Oh, very. They had no eyes for anyone else, as the saying goes. They had no friends, as far as I could tell. Oh. I've been given the impression that she was a shy, nervous person. Have you now? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I got the idea she was on her own so much because she liked it that way. Of course, they'd been very badly off until Robert got this new job. She told me they'd had very little money to live on after all his outgoings. He was paying alimony or whatever it's called to his first wife. People do make such a mess of their lives, don't they? Uh, may I see your right hand, Mrs. Lake? If anyone had told me I'd be holding hands with a policeman this morning, I shouldn't have believed them. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, thank you. So that's how you check fingerprints. I thought it was a much more complicated process. Uh, oh, uh, oh, yes, it is. Uh, tell me, did uh, Angela Hathall have a woman in to help her with the cleaning? Mm, not that I know of. She couldn't have afforded it. Can I be of any further service to you, Mr. Wexford? You wouldn't uh, care to take a cast of my footprints or take blood samples? No, no, that won't be necessary, thank you. But I might uh, need to speak to you again at some point. <laughs> I hope you will. Just the weather for a day by the sea, isn't it? And winter will be with us soon enough. I mustn't keep you. You might at least say it was good of me to come. It was good. <laughs> very public spirited. Good morning, Mrs. Lake. Good morning, Mr. Wexford. You must come to tea one day. That will be respectable enough for you, surely. seaside this afternoon. Murderers are well known for being thoughtless. <laughs> Let's go through it again. What's odd about this case, Mike? Well, lack of prints. Though, of course, she did spring clean the place to impress the old woman. Yeah, and then she uh, wiped everything over again before she went out on a drive. Mrs. Lake had uh, coffee with her at one o'clock. But there aren't any of her prints there, are they? No. Oh. And there's something else on. There's something odd about Hathor's behaviour when he arrived home last night. What do you think happened yesterday afternoon, Mr. Hathor? You're asking me that? Presumably you knew your wife better than anyone else. You'd be most likely to know uh, who called on her or who was asked home by her. I've already told you. Some man broke into the house, some burglar. He took the things on that list and when my wife interrupted him, he killed her. What else could it be? You valued the missing property on this list at less than 50 pounds, all told. Now, I know people have been murdered for less, but I've never known a woman strangled for such a reason. What alternative is there? Tell me who came to your house. 
What friends or acquaintances are called to see you? Oh. We didn't have any friends. He needed money to have friends in a place like this. We didn't have money to join posh clubs or give dinner parties. Angela often didn't see a soul from Sunday night till Friday night. You must have had some friends from your previous life in London. Oh, no. My first wife saw to it I lost all them. Tell me about your first marriage. Twenty years ago. <clears throat> After two years, I knew I'd made a mistake, but we'd had a daughter by that time, so there was nothing I could do about it. I suppose I would have jogged along and made the best of it if I hadn't met Angela at an office party. I was working with uh, Craig and Butler, a firm of accountants in Gray's Inn Road. I, I asked my wife for a divorce. Eileen, Eileen, that's, that's uh, my wife's name. She made hideous scenes. She dragged my mother into it. She dragged Rosemary into it, a girl of 13. I can't describe what my life was like. And this was five years ago? Well, five years ago, yes. Eventually, I, I left home and moved in with Angela. She had a room in Earl's Court. Eileen started a campaign of persecution. She made terrible scenes at the office. She made terrible scenes at the library where Angela worked for the National Archaeologists League. She even came to Earl's Court. I kept begging her for a divorce. And she agreed? Oh, in the end she did, yes. But by that time, Butler had sacked me. Because of Eileen's scene. Sacked me out of hand. It was outrageous. And to crown it all, Angela had to leave the library. I, I managed to get a, a part-time job with a small factory in Tuxborough, but Angela and I were on our beam ends. But then we had what seemed like a piece of luck at the time. Uh, Angela's got a cousin down here, a man called Mark Somerset. Well, he let us have Berry Cottage. Not rent free, of course. That would be pushing generosity too far. But we were literally living on 45 pounds a week. I was paying the mortgage on a house I hadn't set foot in for four years. My first wife, my mother, had poisoned my daughter's mind against me. <laughs> you said you wanted to know about my private life. Well, that's it. Nothing but persecution and harassment. The only bright spark in it was... was Angela. Now she's... dead. What about your mother? What was her attitude? Um, my mother's old-fashioned. She was prejudiced against Angela for what she calls her... her taking me away from Eileen. She's devoted to Eileen. Your mother only met Angela Hathol once. Was the meeting a success? It was a disaster. I persuaded her to come to Earl's Court to meet Angela. She, she took exception to Angela's clothes. She was wearing jeans and uh, that red shirt. And when Angela made some uh, uncomplimentary remark about Eileen, my mother just walked out of the house. What was your reaction when you got to the station last night and your wife wasn't there to meet you? I don't follow you. Well, what was your feeling? Were you uh, alarmed or annoyed? Oh, I certainly wasn't annoyed. I, I thought it was an unfortunate start to the weekend. I, I, I thought that Angela must have been too nervous to come after all. What did you do when you first got to the house? Look, I don't know where this is leading. I, there must be some purpose behind it. Well, I, uh, I called out to Angela. She didn't reply, so I went to look to see if she was in the sitting room or the kitchen. She wasn't there, so uh, I told my mother to go upstairs while I checked to see if the car was in the garage. Wasn't it most likely that uh, the bedroom would be the place where a woman nervous of meeting her mother-in-law would take refuge? But you didn't go there first, as might have been expected. Well, we can't always account for our actions. I disagree. I think we can. If we look into our motives honestly. 
Well, I suppose I thought that if she didn't answer, she wasn't there. Yes, I did think that. I thought that she'd got in the car to meet us and we missed each other because she'd gone some other way round. That's all, Mr. Hathaway. Thank you for coming in. Have you had anything from the, uh, well, the pathologists here? Not yet. His fingerprints. Have you had anything from them? There must be some clues there. Maybe. We don't know yet. It's a very slow process, if you ask me. You'll keep me informed, will you? Once the arrest has been made, I can assure you, you won't be kept in the dark. Mr. Somerset, sir. Chief Inspector Wexford. Paranoia, greed, and the general idea that the world owed them a living. That's what Robert Haffel and my cousin had in common that made it the perfect marriage. You didn't get on. Oh, I'm sorry to hear she's dead. I really am. But I can't pretend I liked her. Had you always felt that way about her? I haven't known her that long. I met her about six years ago when she came over from Australia. She looked me up because I and my father were the only relatives she had in this country, and uh, she was lonely in London, or so she said. You think she had other motives? Well, looking back on it, I think she was on the lookout for any pickings there might be. She was a greedy girl, poor Angela. She hadn't met Robert at that time. When she did, she stopped coming down here, and I didn't hear from her again until they were about to get married and didn't have anywhere to live. I'd written to her some months earlier and told her about my father's death, to which, by the way, she didn't reply. And she wanted to know if I let her and Robert have Berry Cottage. I'd been meaning to sell it, but I couldn't get the price that I wanted, so I let Robert and Angela have it for £30 a week. That's a very low rent, surely? Apparently they were very badly off, and she was my cousin. Yours. I didn't see either of them again until about, um, about 18 months ago. This time they didn't see me. I was in Pomfret with a friend, and I saw Robert and Angela through the window of a restaurant. As it was a very pricey restaurant, I came to the conclusion they must be doing a good deal better financially. Eighteen months ago? Yes. That's quite a while before Hathel got his new job, isn't it, sir? When did you last see either of them? I only saw them once more. Last April, I ran into them in King's Markham. They were loaded down with stuff that they bought, but they seemed depressed in spite of the fact that Robert had got himself this new job. Perhaps they were just embarrassed at coming face to face with me. That was the last time I saw Angela. Oh, uh, she wrote to me about a month ago to say that they'd be leaving the cottage as soon as they found a place in London. They were a happy couple? Very, as far as I could tell. United in gracelessness against the world. No, that's unkind. But I like a little grace in a woman, don't you? Well, thank you, Mr. Somerset. You've been very helpful. Uh, you won't take it amiss if I ask you what you were doing uh, yesterday afternoon. I was at home alone. I took the afternoon off to get ready for my wife coming home from hospital. I was quite alone and didn't see anyone. Well, your wife's been ill. She's been an invalid for years. I'm sorry. I don't suppose you know what uh, other friends your cousin had? None at all, according to her. Everybody she'd ever known, except Robert, had been cruel to her, she said. So, making friends was just to invite more cruelty. I see. Thank you, Mr. Somerset. She was strangled with a gilt necklace. There were shreds of gilding found embedded in the skin. No tissue under her fingernails from the killer, so presumably there wasn't a struggle. Time of death between 1.30 and 3.30. She was a healthy woman, she wasn't pregnant, and there was no sexual assault. It's beginning to look very peculiar. You're saying you think that Hathor's got some sort of guilty knowledge? Yes, I do. You know why? He's never shown any sign of shock. Grief, yes, but that can be simulated. Now, you've seen him, Mike. What is the first reaction of somebody whose wife or husband or child meets with a violent death? No, um, disbelief, I suppose. Yes, disbelief. Robert Hathol has never shown any disbelief. His wife's been killed in a particularly horrible way. 
Yet right from the start, he's just accepted it. First, Mrs. Athol ever come here? Eileen? <laughs> Eileen wouldn't lower herself. What about your granddaughter, Rosemary? Rosemary came once. Once was enough. Anyway, she's too busy with her schoolwork to be out and about all over the place. Would you give me Mrs. Eileen Hathol's address, please? No, I would not. I've got no business with Eileen. Find out for yourself. Time it is. I'm sorry if it's too early for you. I hope I'm not going to be harried. I didn't know that you were a student of Celtic languages. It was Angela's. Oh, I see. I, I, I don't know where she got it from. I had it for ages. Really? This was only published this year. Must be another one, just like it. Yes. Well, it scarcely matters anyway. No, the reason I'm here is that uh, they found your car. It had been abandoned in a side street by Wood Green Station. Do you know the district? No, I've never been there. When can I have it back? Well, in two or three days' time when we've had a good look at it. Oh, examine for those famous fingerprints you're always on about, I suppose. Am I, Mr. Havel? Aren't you rather projecting on me what you think I should feel? Your wife hadn't been sexually assaulted. I thought you'd like to know that. She died very quickly, in perhaps no more than 15 seconds. It's possible she scarcely knew what was happening to her. You won't mind if I borrow this for a few days, will you, sir? Thank you, Mrs. Lake. That'll be all for now. Well, at this stage, of course, I've heard all the evidence. I'd like to express my sympathy with Mr. Happel. But for the moment, there's no other verdict possible but murder by person or persons unknown. Thank you. All to arise. <laughs> Have you seen Sergeant Martin anywhere? Yes, sir. Oh, never mind. Well, I asked you to give me a report on Hathol's car. You did, sir. I put it in your tray. In my tray. There's no light in it, sir. The report, sir. The car was seen by an officer on the beat. The inside had been wiped clean. There were two hairs that matched Angela Hathol's on the driver's seat. And the only fingerprints were on the underside of the boot lid and the underside of the bonnet lid. And they, and they were, were Robert Hathol's. I can read, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Is that all, sir? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, no. Have you uh, been able to find anybody who saw Angela Hathol on Friday afternoon? No, sir. No one's come forward yet. Oh. Right. Thank you, sir. Well, 
This is an unexpected pleasure. If I'd known you came here, I'd eat lunch more often. Thank you. Just a coffee for me, please. Just coffee, Thank dear. You. Aren't you flattered I didn't come for the food? <laughs> Not much of a compliment, really. <laughs> How are you, anyway? Sad. Do you want to discuss it? I don't know. I don't think so. One gets into the habit of secrecy and discretion, even if one doesn't see much point in them. Well, that's true. Or it can be, under certain circumstances. Is it... Very wrong, do you think, to want someone to die? Well, not if the wish remains just a wish. We've all felt that sometimes. But fortunately, most of us let I dare not wait upon I would. Like the poor cat in the adage. Is this enemy of yours uh, at all connected with the habit of secrecy and discretion? I shouldn't have brought it up. I'm lucky, really. It only gets hard sometimes alternating between being a queen and a distraction. You are much too clever not to have guessed what I'm going on about, aren't you? Oh, my cleverness is called into question sometimes. Thank you. Have you brought my book back? I'll have it sent over to you tomorrow, Mr. Hathor. There's also the matter of my car. Inspector Burton? You can have that tomorrow too, sir. I need my car. Tomorrow. So you haven't found anything incriminating in it? I didn't say that, sir. Well, have you? Whoever killed your wife was very clever. I don't know that I've ever met anybody who's covered up his tracks so expertly. What do you think, Mr. Burton? I agree, sir. He seems to have worn gloves to drive your car. He gave it a wash for good measure, too. And nobody saw him park it at Wood Green? Did they, Mr. Burton? No, sir. And nobody was seen driving it on Friday, not even your wife? Oh, he's clever, all right. At the moment, we've got very few leads to go on. Ah. I expect you'll find some more, won't you? Well, it's early days yet, Mr. Hathor. Who knows? One thing I can tell you. We did find the prints of another man other than yourself in this house. Are they, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, on record? They proved to be those of uh, Mr. Mark Somerset. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not myself today. Please sit down. No, that's all right, sir. So, the only prints you found are Mr. Somerset's dear cousin Mark, our tight-fisted landlord. I didn't say that, sir. Well, and mine, and uh, Angela's, of course. Apart from those, we found another. What, uh, another fingerprint? Well, a bit more than that. A woman's whole handprint in your bathroom. A clear print of her right hand. Right down to the little L-shaped scar on the tip of her right forefinger. Perhaps you can throw some light on whose it might be. No idea at all, Mr. Hathall? A clear handprint on the side of the bath an L-shaped scar on the tip of the right forefinger. We shall, of course, take it as a lead in our main line of inquiry. Uh, on the bath, you say? On the bath. I am right in thinking that you can guess whose it might be. No, no, I, no, I don't know. I have the faintest idea. I've noticed how anxious you've been throughout this inquiry to know what we've deduced from fingerprints. I've never known a bereaved husband take such a keen interest in forensics. Have you, Mr. Burden? I can't say I have, sir. It's unusual. I can't uh, help feeling that you expected a certain print to be found, if that is so, and we found it. I must tell you that you will be obstructing this inquiry if you keep what may be vital information to yourself. Don't think you can persecute me. I would advise you to think over what I've said. If you're wise, you will make a full disclosure to us of what I am sure you know. Look, 
I'm not saying his behavior was absolutely normal. I just don't think it was necessarily guilty behavior, that's all. So you don't think he's holding anything back? I'll tell you what I think. You said he didn't show any disbelief. Well, maybe he didn't, but maybe he hadn't really taken in what's happened until just now. When you told him about that print with the L-shaped scar, he seemed genuinely grief-stricken. Grief-stricken? He was horrified. Well, at first, yes, but that's what I mean. It was as if he suddenly saw his wife being murdered and it was real to him for the first time. All right, we'll see. Either you're blind or I am. Pigeon, all right. Well, it's hard to tell with Pigeon. Didn't like the look of it. Now she tells me. I gotta go to London. Tomorrow? For a few days. Well, you could stay with Howard and Denise. Wow. Well, oh, they'd love to see you. They're always saying. You're a snob, Reg Wexford, and about your own nephew, too. What do you mean, a snob? Just because he's a higher rank than you are. Oh, it's nothing to do with and it. And they live in a fashionable part of London. <laughs> Trendy. You see? I just don't feel comfortable with him. It's about time you did. I'll come up with you. Denise and I haven't seen each other for months. It's all right. We'll see you then. All right. Goodbye. Well, it's all fixed. Denise wanted us to stay for the week. Well, you'd better buy me a new dressing gown, then. Reg. Why are you going to London anyway? I have some people to see. Questions to ask. Is it this Berry Cottage business? Yes, it is. Why has this case got under your skin? Something strange about it, Dora. I don't know what it is. He killed her. I don't know how he did it. In fact, it's impossible. But he did it. And he thinks he's got away with it. But he hasn't. My God, he hasn't. I've worked with Bob ever since he came here three months ago. Was he happily married, would you say? Oh, yes. He used to phone her every day. <laughs> I mean, it was terribly sweet, every lunchtime, just before he went to lunch. She was Australian or something. You put the calls through, did you? Sometimes. I wouldn't know if he was happy. He was never terribly lively, not like the other blokes here. What was he like, uh, last Friday? He was just the same as usual. He came in before ten. And he was in here all morning, working out a scheme for private medical insurance for the firm. He phoned his wife a bit before one, and then he went to lunch with Jason. They weren't gone long, they only went to the pub. I know he was back by half past two because he dictated three letters to me. What time did he leave? Half past five. He was meeting his mother at Victoria, he said. Did he get any calls in here from uh, women? Uh, a woman? A girlfriend, you mean. A bit on the side. No. No one ever called him. Was he attracted to any women here? The women here? Well, there are five women working here. Did Mr. Hathall have a special friendship with any of them? You mean a relationship? Like screwing one of them? Well, if you like. He's a lonely man, temporarily separated from his wife. You might care to know that June and Liz are both married, Claire's engaged to Jason, and Suzanne is Lord Carthew's daughter. Oh, and that exempts her from sleeping with men, does it? Well, it jolly well exempts her from sleeping with someone of Bob Hathel's sort. And that goes for all of us. Yes, 
She left here, of course, uh, before her marriage. Yes. How would you describe her? As tough and ungracious or shy and nervous? Well, she was quiet. I could s say, but you now the poor girl is dead. I can't believe it, even as I say it. No, she was ordinary, quite ordinary. Was she interested in Celtic languages? Not that I know. Oh, never mind. Please go on. Well, I hardly know how to go on, Chief Inspector. Angela did her work quite satisfactorily, although she was absent rather a lot on vague medical grounds. Oh, she was bad about money. I mean, she couldn't manage on her salary. I gather she borrowed small sums from other members of the staff, but that was no business of mine. But her work was satisfactory. Yes. There was an occasion, but I have no proof. So it is merely scandal mongering. Most of my work is, Miss Markovich. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, then, eh? In view of the fact that the library members pay a large subscription, we charge no fines should they keep their books beyond the allotted period of one month. Well, I wish my public library operated the same system. Well, a little while after Angela had left us, I happened to be helping out at the returns counter when a member handed to me several books that were some weeks overdue. And he produced £3.60, which he assured me was the proper fine for overdue books. Well, I told him that no fines were ever exacted in this library. He said he's only once before kept books longer than a month. And on that occasion, the young lady had asked him for two pounds forty. And he hadn't protested, thinking it to be reasonable. Go on. Well, of course I made inquiries among the staff who all appeared perfectly innocent. But the two girls told me that other member had recently also tried to get them to accept fines for overdue books. And you think that Angela Hathall is responsible? As I say, I have no proof. But who else could it have been? It's only a small fraud, but I hadn't been expecting a fraud at all. Well, it may be irrelevant. Nothing in a murder case is irrelevant, Howard. I'm beginning to get a picture of Angela. Helps to get to know the victim. Well, what's Angela Hathor looking like? Paranoid. A tendency towards hypochondria, intelligent, but lacking in application. Couldn't persevere with a steady job. A mental stability easily overthrown by adversity. Financially unstable, too. She wouldn't be uh, above making extra money by fraudulent means. Sounds more like a criminal than a murder victim. Come. Your lunch is ready, sir. Thank you. Must be nice to be a chief superintendent. Oh, you wouldn't like it, Uncle Reg. I don't know how you do it, Harry. I don't know how you eat all you do and remain as thin as a leaf. I've only got to pass within uh, ten paces of a potato, and I've grown three pounds. Your mother was the same. Well, I haven't got the Wexford metabolism. I uh, burn up calories like my father. Oh. Was it your partner's son who uh, introduced Robert Hathall to Angela? Oh, no, his nephew, Jonathan. They used to work together at that um, archaeologist library place. Uh, the introduction took place uh, here at the office party. <laughs> a party here? Uh, no, the guests would have been reminded of income tax and would have been much too depressed. And then, no, uh, the party took place at Mr. Craig's home in Finchley. Did you meet uh, Angela Hathor there? Mm. It was the only time I did meet her. A yeah, nice looking creature. A bit of the, um, what is the Shetland pony look that so many of them have nowadays. But Robert was very smitten right from the start, you can see that. Did you ever meet the first Mrs. Hathol? Oh, she was a lively one. We had quite a scene with her banging about trying to get at Bob and Bob locking himself away in his office. She sat on the stairs waiting for him to come out. We stayed there all night. Oh, God knows what time she went home. Next day she came back and screamed at me to get him to go back to her and their daughter. And was that when you sacked him? Did we told you? God damn it, Robert Hathor was always a bit of a liar. I'll tell you exactly what happened. 
I had him in here after that to-do, and I told him he'd better manage his private affairs a bit better. He flew into a rage and said he was leaving. I tried to dissuade him. He wouldn't listen, said the whole world was against him and his Angela, and he left. He got himself some tin pot part-time job and served him right. Did Robert Hathall, as far as you know, ever do anything that was uh, even mildly on the shady side of the law? Lord, no. I've just said he wasn't always strictly truthful, but apart from that, he was perfectly honest. Was he susceptible to women, would you say? Bob was so narrow and downright repressed. He didn't know there were other women on the face of the earth. <laughs> yep, that's why he went overboard for that Angela. Well, he was, he was daft like some schoolboy. The scales dropped from his eyes. He, um, he woke up. You know, uh, these late developers are always the worst. Do you think he might have done away with that Angela? I shouldn't like to commit myself on that, Mr. Butler. No, I suppose not. <laughs> Silly question. I tell you. I thought he was going to murder his first wife. Yep, that's where she had her city. That very step there. You know, I'll never forget that. Never as long as I live. Ah. The only way to account for Hathol's horror when I told him about the handprint is that he arranged the killing of uh, Angela with a woman accomplice. What, somebody he was having an affair with or something? Well, presumably. So um, this uh, girlfriend of his comes round to the cottage in the afternoon. Or she was fetched by Angela. Well, I don't see that part, Reg. Well, a neighbour of hers, a uh, Mrs Lake, said that um, she told her she was going to go out. Now, that has to fit in somehow. So, this girl kills Angela by strangling her with a gilt necklace, which hasn't been found yet. Then she wipes the whole house clean of her own fingerprints, but manages to leave one on the side of the bath. Is that the theory? Yes. Then she drives Robert Hathol's car up to London and abandons it at Wood Green. But does this unknown woman have to be someone he met at work? Why not a friend he met socially? Doesn't seem to have any friends. Yeah, but she could be somebody he picked up in the street or got talking to by chance in a pub. I know. Well, if that's the case, I may as well give up. I'll never find her. Hi! <laughs> That must have been a short play. It was awful. They had a drink in the interval and just looked at each other and slunk off. <laughs> oh, Uncle Reg, your Mr. Burden phoned just now. Really? Mm. Would you ring him back at home? He said it was urgent. Oh, right. Well, use the study. Oh, thanks. Someone's come forward at last. Says he saw Hathel's car being driven into Berry Cottage at five past three last Friday afternoon. Yeah, and... The driver was a dark-haired woman wearing a red-checked shirt or blouse. Yeah. Well, he says there was a passenger, and he thinks it was a woman. But apart from that, no, no, he was just cycling past. Now, do you want the bad news? And then, <laughs> Gertrude sat down at the piano and Hamlet started singing Mammy, and I gave up. Thanks. Oh, I didn't mind that so much. It was all those animals I didn't like. <laughs> Hathol's written a letter of complaint to my chief constable. Griswold? Yeah. Hathol says I'm harassing him. I'm summoned to the presence tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, Denise. I'll be five minutes. What? Five minutes! Yes? Mrs. Eileen Hartholm. Yes? Chief Inspector Wexford, Kings Markham Police. About that business down there, I suppose? Yes. May I come in for a moment? You can sit down, if you like. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Perhaps you can uh, tell me what your movements were last Friday, Mrs. Hathorne. Why? Well, we like to eliminate all possibilities. I was at my father's oh. house in Balham all day. My daughter was on a school trip to France. She didn't get back till midnight. Mr. Hathorne's mother lives in Balham too, doesn't she? 
We grew up together, Bob and me. We went to the same school. And there wasn't a day went by we didn't see each other. After we got married, we were never apart for a single night till that woman came and stole him from me. When was the last time that you saw Mr. Hathorne? I haven't seen him for three and a half years. But he has reasonable access to Rosemary. He was allowed to see her every other Sunday. I used to send her round to his mum and he'd fetch her from there and take her out for the day. You said used to, Mrs. Hathorne. Have these meetings between father and daughter ceased? Well, she's nearly grown up, isn't she? She's old enough to understand what I'd suffered from her father. And it's only natural she was resentful. She thought it was wicked what he'd done. So she stopped seeing him? She didn't want to see him. She said she'd got better things to do with her Sundays. And her gran and me, we thought she was quite right. Me and Bob's mum, we've always got on well. She's been like another mother to me. Did uh, Rosemary ever go down to Berry Cottage? Once. Just once. That was enough. And she came back the state she was in. Tears and sobbing and I don't know what. And I don't wonder. Can you imagine a father actually letting his little girl see him kiss another woman? She saw him put his arms around that woman and kiss her. Not just an ordinary kiss, either. I was disgusted, I can tell you. Disgusted. Well, the upshot was that Rosemary can't stand him, and I don't blame her. I just hope it won't do something to her the way these psychologists say. How did Mr. Hathall take the breaking off of this relationship? Oh, he didn't like it. Not at all, he didn't. Begged her to see him. Wrote a letter, sent her presents. Wanted to take her away on holiday, if you don't mind. Him. I said he hadn't got a penny to bless himself with. Tooth and nail he fought to try and stop me getting this house and a bit of his money to live on. Oh, he's got money enough when he likes to spend it. Money enough to spend on that tart of his. Well, now she's dead. Is that, uh, Rosemary? Yes. That's my Rosemary, taken six months ago. And she's still at school, is she? And going on to college after. All her teachers say she's got it in her and I wouldn't stand in her way. Well, it's not as if she's got to go out and earn money. Her father will have plenty to spare now. Let him pay out a bit. Just because he ruined my life, that's no reason he should ruin hers, is it? Let's be thankful for our wives, Howard. Well, it didn't kill Angela to go back to that one at any rate. It's not her print in the bathroom. No scar on her finger. Reg, look, you obviously know the details of this case far better than I do. But it doesn't seem that you have very much hard evidence against this, Hathor. Evidence? No, it's just a hunch. I know he did it. Hunch? Didn't you ever get a feeling about a case? Didn't you ever feel you knew the answer, in spite of the evidence? I was always a bit more plodding, I suppose. Right, King's Markham, is it? Uh, well, Reg, I have to get to Bournemouth. It's three o'clock, Howard. It's dinner you're speaking at, not IT. Look, you've got your chief constable to see. At five o'clock. He's at a conference. I thought he's trying to bribe his daughter with presents, she said. Holidays. Where was the money meant to be coming from for all this? Not out of 45 pounds a week. How many people do you have on the payroll? Altogether, about 80. And most of them women working part-time. What about office staff, people that uh, Hathol would have come into contact with regularly? Well, that would be myself, um, Mr... Mr Oldbury, the personnel manager, uh, my secretary, uh, two typists and the switchboard operator. Uh, that's in addition to Mr Hathol himself, a part-time accountant. So, in this situation, the police is constrained by society to be pragmatic. So, in this situation, Society forces the police to be pragmatic. 
I've done my best to make you a list of names and addresses, but the way girls chop and change these days, there isn't anyone in the office now who was here when Mr. Hathel was here. Not girls, that is. That was only ten weeks ago. Can you remember if he was particularly friendly with any girl here? Oh, I can remember that he wasn't. He was crazy about that wife of his, the one who got herself killed. What about uh, people who might call in occasionally? Sales rep, people of that sort. Well, the sales reps all work from our London office. There's only one woman among them, and he never met her. Can you think of anyone else? No. Well, you're only left with the cleaners. There's one cleaning woman who's been with us ever since we started up, but she's 62. <laughs> of course, she has a couple of girls working with her, but I never see them, and Mr. Hathel wouldn't have They're finished before we come in. The only one I can recall offhand, I remember, because she was so honest. She stayed behind one morning to hand me a five-pound note that she'd found under someone's desk. <laughs> no, Mr. Hathel was almost peculiar about his wife. I've never heard a man go on about a woman the way he went on about her. She was Marilyn Monroe and Princess Di and the Virgin Mary, all rolled into one to hear him talk. Thought he would be. Fed up with hearing about how fond he was of that wife of his. You all right, Howard? Take the upper road when you get to the fork. I'll direct you via Pomfret. Why do I want to go via Pomfret? Big quicker. Slow down. What? what? What for? Slow down here. Berry Cottage is coming up here on the right in a minute. Oh, I might have known. There he is, in the garden. That's him, that's Hathol. Did you get a look at him? Yes, I saw him. I don't have to identify him, you know. No. But uh, there's something sinister about him, isn't there? Not particularly, no. Grizzly's here already. Probably arrived early to sharpen his teeth. <laughs> Good luck, Reg. Yeah. Good luck with your speech, too. Oh, I've had plenty of time to polish the platitudes, thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Chief Constable's waiting for you. Thank you, Polly. Ah, oh, Mr. Wexford. The Chief Constable's in the conference room. Thank you, Sergeant Martin. Sir? Come. Ah, Chief Inspector. Good afternoon, sir. Sit down, Reg. Perhaps you've some idea why I've asked to see you. I can guess. Hathol's been complaining. The fact that you can guess only makes it worse. Mr. Hathol has sent me a very strongly worded letter of complaint. He says you've been trying to trap him using unorthodox methods. He says you sprang something about a fingerprint and then walked out of his house without waiting for his answer. Now, this man's a troublemaker, Reg. He says he's got a friend on one of the tabloids who's interested in his case. Now, have you got any real grounds for thinking that he killed his wife? Not with his own hand, sir. He was in his office in London at the time of the murder. Well, then what the hell are you playing at? I'm proud of this force. My life's work's been devoted to it. And I'm proud of my officers, confident that their conduct is not only beyond reproach, but can be seen to be beyond reproach. Why are you harassing this man? Persecution is what he calls it. Persecution is what they always call it. And that means? He's paranoid, sir. Oh, don't give me that head shrinker's jargon, Reg. Have you got one concrete piece of evidence against this chap? Oh, just a very strong personal feeling that he killed his wife. Feeling? Feeling? We hear a damn sight too much about feelings these days. Now, at your age, you ought to bloody well know better. So what does that mean, then? Hmm? That he had an accomplice? And you also have a feeling about who this accomplice might be? Or do you actually have some evidence about him? No, no, I haven't, sir. So it's just a sort of general conspiracy theory? May I see the letter? No, you may not. I've told you what's in it. 
be thankful that I'm sparing you his uncomplimentary remarks about your manners and tactics. Oh, he says you've stolen a book of his. Oh, good God, sir, you don't believe that? Well, no, Reg, I don't. But I have it sent back to him pronto, right? Yes, sir. Reg. If I thought you'd got one shred of evidence against Hathel, I'd back you all the way. You know that. But you've got nothing, apparently. In the circumstances, I've got to tell you to lay off him, understand? Lay off him? But I've got to talk to him. I've got no other line of inquiry to... I said lay off him. That is an order. I won't have any more of it. I will not have the reputation of this police force sacrificed to your feelings. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Have some breakfast. No, it's all right. Thanks. I've already had mine. Well, help yourself to a cup of tea. Oh, you might pour me one out while you were at it. Griswold's told me to lay off Hathol. Yes, I heard. Damn nerve. Well, you haven't got any evidence, you know, Reg. Hathol did it. Yeah, but there's no indication that he even looked at another woman, let alone conspired with her to do murder. That handprint, three long dark hairs on the bathroom floor, and the woman who was seen in Angela's car. If you only thought it was a woman, could just as easily have been a man. How many times have you and I seen someone across the street and not been able to make up our minds if it was a man or a woman? Well, you were supposed to be on a diet. Well, I am. Where's Dora? She's still in London, with my nephew and his wife. All right, so what's your idea? How do you think the handprint got on the bath? I'll tell you. First of all, I think it was a man who killed Angela. She was lonely and she picked him up, like you said at first. Only he turned nasty and he strangled her. By accident, maybe, while he was trying to get the necklace off her. What? Oh, well, I don't mean literally by accident. But maybe he panicked, lost his head. Now, there wouldn't have to be any of his prints around the house because well, why would he touch anything? Apart from Angela, that is. And even if he did, there wouldn't be many prints, and he could always wipe them off afterwards. What about the woman's handprint on the bath? The woman who left that print isn't even involved. She was a passerby, motorist, who called and asked to use the phone. And the bath? Well, the toilet. Oh, come on! <laughs> These things happen, Reg. Why couldn't it happen to Berry Cottage? The woman hasn't come forward because she didn't even know the name of the house or the woman who let her in. And there aren't any about prints around the phone or anything because Angela was still cleaning the place when she left. I've never heard so much tosh in all my life. <laughs> That's just as reasonable as this conspiracy theory of yours. Griswold likes it, does he? What do you mean? Well, that's what he calls it. A conspiracy theory. He called me in after you'd left, asked me what my ideas were. And you told him? Yes, I did. I didn't do anything underhand, Reg. No, I'm sure you didn't. You're in charge of the case now, are you, Mike? No, no, of course not. You're still in charge. But we follow your line of inquiry. It's just that he doesn't want any more trouble with Hathor. No. Well, if we leave Hathor out of it, your theory makes as much sense as anything else.
Hallo? Hallo? I'm off now. Morning. Hi, how are you? I'm looking for Mr. Hathaway. Oh, we just moved in here. I'm Valerie Snyder. Oh. Well, maybe he was the last tenant. Yeah, that's right, Hathaway. How long ago did he move? Well, we've been here, what, two weeks, but he'd moved out already when we first saw the place six weeks ago. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We can't hold Druitt any longer on that breaking and entering at Squires. Is there anything we can hold him on? Druitt's a nuisance in King's Markham. I'll have another look. This is Wilson. Look, uh, send somebody over to see her. Give her a good talking to. Go yourself if you like. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, that's about it then. Anything on the Angela Hassall murder? Oh. Nothing new there. Still looking for a man who kills for nine quid odd of gilt necklace? Something like that, yeah. Can't be any easier now that Hathor's moved away. Actually, it hasn't made a great deal of difference, sir. He's been very cooperative wherever he was living. Has he now? And where is he living? Or does it have to be cleared by the Home Secretary? London. He's got a flat in Hampstead. I find it ironic that a man can kill his wife, arrange for his mother to find the body, and be regarded by the police as cooperative. It would only be ironic if Hathor did kill his wife. He didn't. He's just got an unfortunate manner that's got in your hair, that's all. Look, I'd like to get this Hathor business out of the way once and for all, right? Well, go on. You see, I've always thought there was one major drawback to your theory. If Hathor had had an accomplice with that scar on her finger, he'd have insisted that she wore gloves. Because he'd have known that if she left only one print, just one print, He'd never be able to live with her or marry her or even see her again. Because he knows that if he shows the slightest interest in another woman, we're going to be down on her like a ton of bricks. So if you're saying that Hathor murdered his wife in order to be free to live with this other woman, he can't have done. It's as simple as that. My God, yes. It is as simple as that. <laughs> You must understand what that handprint did to him, Howard. Isn't it time you forgot about this case, Reg? He had Angela killed so that he could be with the other woman. But when I told him about the handprint, he knew that he'd never dare see her again. There was a terrible sadness on his face. Even so, the man's a murderer. She could have the scar surgically removed. We have a print of the whole hand. Nothing she can do about that. Well, you put yourself in his place. He knows that he has to uh, get rid of me before he can possibly enjoy what he's killed for. He manages to pull the wool over Griswold's eyes sufficiently to uh, get me off his back. Even so, the handprint had been found. So he couldn't go into uh, public courtship 
or marriage with a woman whose hand will betray her. All right, I'll go along with that for a bit. So what can he do? Well, they can agree to part. What, you mean um, shake hands forever? Oh, presumably, even if you're madly in love, liberty is better than imprisonment. Or they, uh, they could agree not to meet again, just go on living clandestinely, never meeting in public. Why else has he hidden himself away in West Hampstead where nobody knows him? Hmm? Why not south of the river, where it can be near his mother and his daughter? See what I mean, Howard? He's hidden himself away so that he can uh, sneak out in the evening and be with her. Of course, the only woman he's been seen with is his mother. Oh, Reg, uh, you don't mean to say you've got somebody watching him? I'm taking this seriously, Howard. Yes, I can see you are. So is your chief constable. Look. Look, Reg. Dora's worried about you. Oh, Dora fusses. Still, it is expensive out of my own pocket. <laughs> he's not a very good spy, but he's the best I can get. I took it upon myself to investigate the party's place of domicile. During a conversation with the landlord, during which I represented myself as an official of the local rating authority, I inquired as to the number of apartments and was informed that only single rooms were to let in the establishment. He also seems to have disposed of his car, it having disappeared from its customary parking place. On the evening of Thursday the 10th, he arrived home at 6.10, and then at 6.30 he left again and boarded the number 28 bus at West End Green. I want you to follow him on that 28 bus, Tommy. It's not easy following a chap on a bus, Wexford. Suppose he goes up top, say, and I go inside, or vice versa. I don't see why it should be vice versa. Just sit in the seat behind him and stick close. It's not my line of work, Wexford, you know. Now listen, Tommy. I know enough about you to put you inside for a nice long while. Mm -hmm. And came out of the supermarket at approximately 3.10. The subject proceeded to... Did you see in the paper that that Mrs Somerset died? What? Mrs Somerset. What was her husband's name? Martin? No, Mark. Mark Somerset. Well, what about him? She died. Wasn't she something to do with that Hathel case? Oh, uh, vaguely. The old Berry Cottage. Well, it was in the paper about her funeral. Well, she'd been an in invalid a long time, so he said. The subject proceeded to Sued America Tours, a travel agency on the Finchley Road, and stayed inside the agency for 23 minutes. Hello. Hello, Reg. How are you? Yes, why? What's going on? Ah. Well, of course, Tommy didn't dare follow him in there. Lily-livered little idiot. Well, I don't see what you can do about it, Reg. Well, he's heading for some country with no extradition treaty. Ever since I found out that he was living in one room, I've been wondering what he's been doing with his money. I mean, he's earning good money at Marcus Flower. Well, why should he throw up his job and flit to Brazil or somewhere? He's scared, Howard. He's terrified. He knows I'm not going to give up. You may be right, Reg. Howard, will you do something for me? Would you get on to Marcus Flower and find out if they're sending him abroad? I dare not. Oh, I don't know, Reg. Um, your chief consul was pretty adamant, wasn't he? I can't cross swords with him. Anyway, if Marcus Flower was sending him abroad, wouldn't they be arranging the whole thing and paying for it? Well, they wouldn't be paying and arranging for his girlfriend, would they? No. No, that's true. Uh, look, Reg, um, I'll call you back tomorrow. Right. I know you haven't forgotten you're taking me to the cinema this evening. Which cinema? You are the end, Howard. It's your idea, all this, and you've completely forgotten, haven't you? Yes. We're going to the Curzon, Howard. 
Right, fine, fine. Really getting worried about Red, you know. There, 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 there. Anyone ever tell you you were brilliant? Good God, you really are brilliant. What? It's him, Robert Hathor, Uncle Reggie's wife killer. Which one? Tall bloke with the blonde. He was right. The old bugger was right. You can't have. And that's not all, Reg. He wasn't alone. He was with a woman. We've seen him with a woman, Reg. The Lord hath delivered him into mine hands. What happened? Tell me. You see my eye? Of course I see it. What the hell have you done to yourself? I'll tell you who done it. That Hathel. Oh, for heaven's sake. Last night when I was following him down to the 28 bus stop. He's on to you. Well, thank you for the sympathy. I told you he'd spot me. He didn't have no cause to turn around and poke me in the bleeding eye, though, had he? Is that what he did? Tell you it wasn't so bleeding funny. Did you stop the bleeding? Well, it stopped after a time by itself. But... That bus that Hathol catches. Where does he go? 28. Gold is Green, Charles Hill, Fortune Green, West End Lane, West Hampstead Station, Quicks Road, Kilburn Eye Road. Well, that doesn't mean a thing to me. Where does it end up? Once with the bridge. Well, he must be going to see his mother in Ballam. No, no, no. Not where the 28 bus goes, he isn't. Look, Wexford, you don't know London. You said so yourself, but no one would go to Ballam that way from West Hampstead. Oh, well, how would they go? Up to West Hampstead tube and change to the northern line at Charing Cross. Then he must be getting off somewhere along that route. Look, Tommy, will you do one more thing for me? No. We know that he's meeting a woman somewhere. It's probably on that 28 bus route. I'm not going to follow him, and that's that. Why, well, you wouldn't be in any danger. Oh, yeah. You're a lot always say that. Well, I can't do it. He knows me. You can follow him in your car. You wouldn't have to be inside the bus with him. He's an animal, Wexford, and he knows me now. You seem to forget he's already done away with his wife. Who's going to look after my interest if he starts throttling me with his gold chains? Same as looks after you now, the Social Security. Quite uncalled for, Wexford. Isn't that your ex-husband's car outside? He gave it to Rosemary. Gave it? Well, he won't need it where he's going, will he? Well, where is he going, Mrs. Howell? Brazil. It's all fixed up. He goes on the 21st. But that's less than a month. Good riddance to bad rubbish, I say. Has he got a job there? A job? He's got a very important position with a firm of international accountants. You wouldn't believe the money he's getting. He told Rosemary and she told me. They're paying me from London, deducting what I get before it even goes to him. And he'll still have thousands and thousands a year to live on, and a house there waiting for him. Why do you want to know? You think he killed that woman, don't you? Do you? I wish he had. I just wish he had. And I wish they had hanging still, too. Reg, did you get those tickets? Sorry? The theatre tickets. I'll go and get them tomorrow. Oh, Reg. I'll get them tomorrow. There won't be any left tomorrow. We were told that. Really? I don't know what you think you're doing, Reg. It's like living with a zombie. Dora... You never talk to me. You never hear a word, I say. Dora... You're making a fool of yourself. You're neglecting your proper work. Who says I am? Everybody. Mike Burden. Everybody. Mike Burden. Well, I'm not standing for it, Reg. I am not standing by and see you throw your career away over some stupid obsession.
you'll get the police force a bad name hanging about in bars. Wow. Is that all you can say? No. Let me buy you a drink. It's done. Bernard's bringing O. Here he is now. There you go. This is late. Nice drop of Moe. Thanks, Bernard. Mr. Wexford will open it. There you go, Mr. Wexford. You looked as if you needed cheering up. Well, there's no need to worry about the force's good name now. This will do wonders for his image. Oh, is that all it takes? A bottle of champagne. Oh. No. Champagne is secondary. Oh. You know what it takes. Then you've got to do it yourself if you really believe he's guilty. Oh, he's guilty, all right. Then take the time off and do it yourself. Yes. I don't want it to become an obsession. I even dream of Robert Hassel. Dream about someone nicer tonight. Good night, Rich. Come down and let you in. I'd like you to introduce me to the woman you brought in here. man wants to see you. This is my daughter, Rosemary. Hathol's bound to put in another of his complaints. What a mess, eh? Gonna lose my job next. Not without an inquiry or not. I don't think Hathol's going to want to appear in front of an inquiry. It wasn't his daughter I saw him with, Reg. You saw... 
A woman with short fair hair. But are you sure that it was Hathol you saw with her? I'm sure. You've only seen him once. It was Hathol. Would you swear, would you swear in a court that the man you saw at the Curzon Cinema was the same man that you saw in the garden at Berry Cottage? If a man's life depended on it, would you swear? Now, the death penalty is no longer with us, Reg. Thank God. But would you swear? You're pressing me too hard, but I am sure, beyond a reasonable doubt, yes, I saw Robert Hathel in Curzon Street with the fair-haired woman. Look, if he isn't with her, where does he go all those evenings when he's out? Where does he go on the 28 bus that Tommy Matthews sees him catch? I don't know. I can't follow him on the bus, and Tommy won't. Somebody else has got to do it. Well, that's easy to say. My chief constable says no, and you're not going to cross swords with my chief constable by lending me some of your blokes, are you? You're right, I'm not. Well, then we can stop talking about it, and I can go back to King's Markham and face the music. A bloody great symphony in Griswold Sharp Major, while Hathol goes off to the sunny tropics. I'll do it. Whiskey! Go on, boy! What do you mean? I'll do it. You? You can't. You're a superintendent. Don't be such a snob. I want to do it. Besides, I owe you an apology, Reg. Mind you, I might not be as good as Tommy Matthews. What about your own work? Don't you think I have some say in the hours I work? There's one factor in all of this I don't think you've taken sufficiently into account. One personality. Angela. Yeah. It was when he met her that he changed. Now, this is an outside chance. Maybe it's off the wall. But you know that she'd already been up to some kind of fraud on her own with the library girls. What if she was encouraging Hathor into some kind of dishonesty? That money must have come from somewhere, Reg. Well, there's only one place where that could be possible. This is the theme tune, in fact, for the Run the World thing a couple of years ago. Here's Tears for Fears. Everybody wants to rule the world on compact disc. Cooking the books? Oh, we've never had anything like that here. Well, I'm not saying that, Mr. Avery. I'm working in the dark. But you have heard of the old payroll, Phil. Oh, no one will get away with that here. And not with our system. We're completely computerized, you know. Really? Messing about with the wages, you mean? Suppose you tell me how you and the accountant manage the payroll. It's like this. When we sort of get a new worker, I sort of tell him her details, and he works out her wages from them. Can you be more explicit? No. Right. Well, let's say we take on a, um, let's call her, uh, Joan Smith. Mrs. Joan Smith, I tell the accountant her name and address, say, uh... 24 Gordon Road, Toxborough. <laughs> fine, fine. I tell him that, uh, Mrs. Joan Smith of, uh, whatever it was, Gordon Road, Toxborough. How do you tell him? By... Telephone or chat? Well, well, either, really. Um, but of course, I put it down on record. I, I don't have a very good memory. I tell him her name and address and when she's starting and her hours and whatever, and, well, he just feeds it straight into the computer and Bob's your uncle. After that, I do it every week to work out her overtime and, um, you know, whatever the rest. And when she leaves, do you tell him that too? Oh, yes, sure, sure. They're always leaving. Chop and change, it's everlasting. Are they all paid by weekly wage packets? No, 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 not all. You see, a lot of our ladies don't use their wages for, um, well, you know, housekeeping. They're, they're, their husbands are the... What is the word? The... Breadwinners. Breadwinners, thank you. Yes, their husbands. Um, no, our ladies use their, their wages for, uh, well, holidays and sort of improving the home and, well, just saving, I suppose. Yes, I see that, but so what? Well, they don't get wage packets. Their wages are paid into a, into a bank account, or, in fact, more likely, um, the post office or a, or, a, or a trustee's savings bank. And if they are, is that fed into the computer too? Yes, absolutely right. Quick thinking, if I may say so. Not at all. So the accountant can invent a woman, feed a fictitious name and address into the computer, the wages go into the bank, and the accountant, or his female accomplice, can draw on it whenever they choose. That would be fraud. Yes, it would. But since you keep records, we can verify this. Right. So what would you need to know? The names and addresses of all the women who joined when Hathol was accounted. Uh, no, well, I should think most of them would have left by now. Oh, that's all right. Those who have left are probably the ones that I'm interested in. No, you don't understand. We destroy the records after they leave. We delete them from the memory. I mean, the memory will get overloaded otherwise.
Well, well. Chief Inspector Lovett. No, thanks, Brock. You're a long way from Meridian. Seven and a quarter mile. I know you won't tell me what you're doing here, but will you answer me one question? Has it got anything to do with a man called Hathol? Howard phoned you about an hour ago. Has any news? This is all to do with this man you're meant to be having nothing to do with, isn't it? Arthur. Yes, I expect it is. Dora. What did Howard say? Well, he said I was to tell you she lives in Notting Hill. Does she now? Does she? It's no good phoning him. He'll be out till late. Oh, hell. Anyway, he told me the whole thing. Go on. Well, Hazel hadn't come home at all yesterday evening, so this evening he got the idea of tailing him from the office. Yes. Hazel went to the tube. OK. Now, Howard knew he wasn't going home because he walked to Marble Arch. Hang on. So he walked from uh, Half Moon Street to Marble Arch, right? Howard said the very fact that he went to Marble Arch proved he wasn't going home because Marble Arch is only on the, uh, what is it, the Circle Line? Uh, the Central. Central, yeah. yes, that's it. He said if Hathor was going home, it was much closer for him to go to Green Park Station and there he could get some other line direct to West Hampstead where he lives. Yeah, I see what he means. The Jubilee Line. So what's this about Notting Hill? Well, Howard said he suddenly realised that if Hathel went to see this girl sometimes by 28 bus from West Hampstead and sometimes by Central Line Underground from the West End, well, all he had to do was find out where the 28 bus route and the Central Line intersect. And that's Notting Hill, he said. Dora. Dora. Notting Hill's a vast area. What is it about this case, Reg? Dora, Hathol's a murderer. You believe? Yes. And he's leaving the country in two weeks' time. And you're gambling with your whole career because of him? Yes. I understand how it all happened now. Robert Hathol, Angela and a woman accomplice worked a payroll fraud for a couple of years. Then Robert got a, a new job and didn't need to fiddle. The other woman should have faded away, but she didn't because Hathol had fallen for her. Angela was furious. She gave Hathol an ultimatum, either she goes or I'll shop you. Hathol agreed to end the affair. Angela was delighted. She even agreed to have her mother-in-law come and stay with her. She cleaned up the whole place to impress her. So how does the other one come into it again? Ah, oh, well, she rang up on some pretext. Didn't want any bad blood between them. Could she call on her? Angela was triumphant. She even went and fetched her in the car. Brought her back. And then the other woman strangled Angela, as agreed, with Hathor. She cleaned up, but she left one handprint on the edge of the bath. Now, Look, Reg, I'm sure you're right, but it is still mostly in your head, isn't it? When I'm dead, it'll be engraved on my heart. Hathol did it. Good day, gentlemen. We've got a special on today, moussaka. Oh, that'll do me. And a uh, steak pie for you, Mr. Burton. Thank you. I saw Brock Lovett yesterday. He was as loquacious as ever. Oh, yes? In Doxborough. Really? I thought he was too busy digging up Myringham Old Town. Digging? Yes, didn't you know? He's got some girl who's missing who he thinks has been murdered, so he's digging for her. I think those badges he sits up all night watching have finally gone to his head. <laughs> he's arrested the husband, too. For murder? No, there's not enough evidence without the body. But the bloke's got a record, so he's holding him on some shop-breaking charge. Oh. Some people get all the luck.
Sorry, sir, no one's allowed in here. Don't you know me, Hutton? Oh, it's Mr. Wexford. <laughs> uh, beg pardon, sir. Where can I find Chief Inspector Lovett? Down with the digging, sir. Well, what are they looking for? A Mrs. Morag Gray. She and her husband squatted here for a bit last summer. Mr. Lovett thinks her husband may have buried her in the garden. What makes you think she's here? Got to be somewhere. You think the husband killed her? You got him on a shot-breaking charge. Got no body. Just a missing woman. Something must have made you take that seriously. Her mother. Rob, you do me a favor. Yep. You know that guy Hathol I'm always on about? Well, I think he was working a payroll fiddle when he was at Kids in Toxborough. That's why I was over there the other day when, when we met. Grizzlies warned me off. I've got no authority to act. If I gave you the details, could you send someone to the local trustee savings bank? Find out if they can smell out any false accounts. Will do. I've only got ten days. On the 21st, the bird migrates to South America. Okay. Mrs. Lake. Hello. There are policemen all over the place down here, but I didn't expect to see you. You've been avoiding me again. Ah, oh, can I give you a lift to King's Markham? Thank you. Oh, I'm not going home. Oh? I just wanted to sit in the car for five minutes and chat to you. Shall we share a cream cake? Oh, uh, no, thank you. It's uh, bad for my figure. Oh, but you've got a lovely figure. There you go again. You're always saying things that no woman has said to me for 20 years. <laughs> it can't be always. I never see you. I've sold my house. Yes, yeah, so I heard. I shall be moving out next week. They say you're going abroad. Do they now? They've been saying things about me around here all my life, mostly distortions of the truth. Are they saying that my dream has come true at last? No, I, I hadn't heard that bit. I mustn't keep you. Once, it seems years ago now, I asked you to come and have tea with me. So you did. Shall we say next Tuesday? Yeah, I'll come. I shall tell you the story of my life, and all shall be revealed. There's your blockage. interested in this. Similar. 
Well, the lab boys couldn't be 100% certain. But I suppose they have a feeling. Apart from the similarities, do you have a shred of evidence to show that this necklace is in any way connected with her death? No, sir, but I might have if I could talk to Hathor. He wasn't there when she was killed. But his girlfriend was. Where? When? I'm supposed to be Chief Constable. Why have I not been told if the identity of some female accomplice has been discovered? Well, I haven't exactly... Then what's the matter with you? You haven't got any more evidence of Robert Hathorl's complicity in this than you had three months ago. I know it, you know it. Is everything all right at home? Yes, sir. Well, I'm worried about you. I've asked you before, and I'll ask you again. Have you got one concrete piece of evidence? Have you? No, sir. Then the situation is unchanged, totally unchanged. You're skating on thin ice, Chief Inspector. Just remember that. Are you watching me like that? I'm not. Oh, I should be glad when this week is over and that man's gone to wherever he's going and you're back to your normal self again. There. Doesn't that look nice? Lovely. This is for your grandson's birthday. You might at least show a bit of interest. Well, you complained about me looking a minute ago. I remember once asking me about a woman called Lake. The one you said reminded you of George II. I didn't say that. Ah, something like that. Well, I thought you might be interested to know she's getting married. To that Somerset man. Remember I saw in the paper his wife died. I imagine something must have been going on there for years. Quite a mystery. He can't have made any deathbed promises about only taking mistresses, can he? Darling, I do wish you'd show a bit of interest sometimes and not look so perpetually fed up. Uh, no, sir. He's in court. Can I do anything? No. No, thank you, Sergeant. Now, apart from this, what do Richard Gray's criminal proclivities amount to? It's true he was dismissed by his previous employer, though he freely admits it, though no charge was brought. Appropriating from his employer the negligible sum of £9.50. As a result, he was obliged to leave his tired cottage at Maynot Hall, Toxborough. And as an even more serious result, was deserted by his wife, uh, Maura Gray, on the ground that she refused to live with a man whose honesty was not beyond reproach. Uh, He's uh, going to get off, isn't he? Most like it. You haven't had any luck finding the body. Sod slower, isn't it? I got a body and no murderer, and you got a murderer and no body. <laughs> I don't suppose you've uh, had time to look into those saving bank accounts. We found two so far. They look suspicious. There's one in the TSB here and uh, one in Toxborough. They both had regular payments made into them from Kid and Co. And in both cases, the payments ceased around about March or April. Now, the one here in Moreynham is in the name of a woman. Her address turns out to be a sort of uh, boarding house, come a tell. And the people there can't remember her. And we can't trace her. But what about the one in Toxborough? Complicated. <clears throat> it's in the name of Mrs. Mary Lewis, and the address is a Toxborough address, but the house is shut up, the people are evidently away. The neighbours say that their name is Kingsbury, not Lewis, but they've taken in lodges over the years. One of them could be a Lewis. We just have to wait till the people come back. Well, do the neighbours know when they're coming back? We'd been lovers for 19 years. I'd been married for five years when I came to live here. 
I was walking in the lane one day when I met Mark. We tried not seeing each other. Sometimes we kept it up for months, but uh, it never really worked. Well, why didn't you get married? Neither of you had children. My husband died. We were going to marry. But then Mark's wife became ill, and he couldn't leave her. So, you remained faithful and lived in hopes? No. There were others. Mark knew, if he minded, he never blamed me. Was it she you meant when you said, uh, was it wrong to wish for someone's death? Yes, I'm afraid so. Who else? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> you didn't think I meant Angela. Why have you been avoiding me, Reg? I'm not accustomed to being turned down. No. I can imagine that. I'm not blind, you know. You think I'm blind? No. Just unapproachable. Yes, well, I, I think I'd better go. I shall be leaving on Monday. The new people are moving in. We shan't meet again. I could promise you that, if you like. Why do you think I want to be the last fling for a woman going to her first love? Isn't it a compliment? I'm a middle-aged man. Middle-aged men who are taken in by compliments are pathetic. I'm a middle-aged woman. We could be pathetic together. Would you like a drink? Oh, we could talk. We've never really talked. We've never done anything else but talk. Yes. I'd like a drink. I'll drink to your happiness. Mm. Nancy? Expecting him to? No. No. Reg? Reg, I saw them. Him and her together. I saw them together, and I'm afraid I lost them. Oh, God. It's more than I can take. And don't kill the messenger, Reg. Oh, no, I, I'm not angry with you, Howard. Not after all you've done. Well, tell me, what happened? Well, I took the afternoon off. I knew that Hathel would have taken his leave of Marcus Flower by now, and I presumed to be at home. I sat there and sat there. At five o'clock, I thought of going home myself. Perhaps it would have been better if I had. At least I wouldn't have raised your hopes. Anyway, I thought I might as well wait until the rush hour was over. And he came out again. I followed him up to West End Lane, and I was just parking the car to follow him on foot when a taxi came by, and he hailed it. You didn't manage to follow the taxi. Well, well, it wasn't that difficult, Reg. Anyway, 
It dropped Hathel off outside a pub in the Pembridge Road. It's called the Artesian. I waited a few minutes to let him settle. I saw him as I went in. But either he was early or she was ten minutes late, because he just sat there with two drinks in front of him. A gin for himself and a perno for her. Most of the time, the crowd blocked my view of him, but I could see that glass of yellow perna waiting on the table for her. I didn't know she'd come in until I saw a hand go round that yellow glass, and it was lifted up out of my sight. It was the same woman I'd seen him with outside the Curzon cinema. A woman in her mid-thirties with dyed blonde short hair. No, don't ask. I didn't see if she had a scar on her forefinger. What happened? I think Hathel may have recognized me. God, he'd have to be blind not to have by now, even though I've been very careful. Anyway, they drank their drinks quite quickly and then pushed their way out. I think she must live quite near there, but where exactly, I've no idea. They caught a taxi outside, but I didn't hear him tell the driver where he wanted to go. They just climbed in, he slammed the door, and I could still see him talking to the driver as they moved off. And that's the last of Robert Hathor. Well, it scarcely matters now. He's off tomorrow. You were right all along the line, Reg. I'm afraid that has to be your only consolation. Detective Chief Inspector Wexford's office. Oh. No, no, he doesn't want... Hold on. It's Chief Inspector Lubbock from Myringham, sir. All oh, right. <coughs> no, he's here, sir. Well, send him up. I'm oh, sorry, sir. Uh, could Mr Lubbock come into Mr Wexford's office? Thank you. Must be important. Get Mr Burden in here. Mr Burden's over at my fleet, sir. Oh, damn! Ah, oh, Brock. Sergeant Hutton, come in, come in. Morning. I'll be day, innit? Oh, never mind about the day. Damn the day. I don't care if it snows. Dear me. Uh, Mr. Lovett has something to tell you, sir, which he thinks will interest you greatly. Hmm. And since it was you who put him onto it, it seemed only courtesy well, to that. Well, sit down. Do anything you like. Oh, uh, sad man, get some coffee, will you? And sir. call Mr. Burden and ask him to come in here as soon as he gets back. Thanks, sir. Just tell me one thing, Brock. Can you extradite a man for what you've found? Because if you can't, you've had it. Hathol's leaving for Brazil today. In fact, ten to one, he's gone already. Oh, dear, oh, dear. 
Well, regarding the accounts... Well, I'd better tell you what we have found on these phony accounts. Now, <clears throat> we called last night at the house of Mr. and Mrs. Kingsbury. <clears throat> they just returned from a visit to their married daughter. She'd been having a baby. No Mary Lewis has ever lodged with them, and they've never had any connection with Kid and Cole. That's one account he was funneling money through. Well, there might be others at other banks, so we just wanted the quickest results first. Absolutely right, Sergeant. Also, on making further inquiries at this boarded house I told you about, he could find no evidence at all of the existence of the other so-called account holder. Well, there's another. Ah, Mike. We've got something on Hathol. Have you got a warrant for his arrest, Brock? Well, we'd certainly like to talk to Mr. Hathol. Apart from the courtesy of the matter, we called on you for his present address. His present address is probably five miles up in the air above Madeira, or wherever the damn plane flies. Unfortunate. What are you going to do about it, Brock? Well, only suggestion I can make is that we both go out to high trees and lay the matter before old Grip, the chief constable. I must make sure I've got my facts straight before we see Griswold. What are the names and addresses of those fictitious account holders? Uh, the uh, boarding house place was uh, in the name of Mrs. Dorothy Carter. And it's Ascot House, Marlham. And the other one is Mrs. Mary Lewis at 19 Maynard Way, Toxborough. I don't believe it. What were you doing at Kids when I met you there the other day? I was pursuing my inquiries into the disappearance of Morag Gray. She worked at Kids for a while, cleaning, when her husband was gone in up at Maine at all. Naturally, we explored every way open to us. Well, you didn't explore Maine out way enough. Morag Gray isn't buried in anybody's garden. She was Hathor's accomplice in the payroll fraud. He met her when they both worked at Kids. She and his wife, Angela, had the job of making withdrawals from those accounts. Hathol fell for her, and she murdered his wife for him. She isn't dead, Brock. She's living in London as Hathol's mistress. She's gone to Brazil with him. Ladies, gentlemen, Robert Hathel and a woman calling herself Mrs. Hathel are on the passenger list of a flight leaving for Rio de Janeiro at 16.45. Well, let's hope we're not too late now. No need to be bitter, Reg. The evidence we have now is a bit more than just a feeling. I think you'll agree. It's ready to do now, sir. Robert Hathel and, uh... Morag Gray, sir. ...will be stopped at the airport and held on a charge of deception under the Theft Act. I know I can rely upon you, gentlemen. It would be most unfortunate if these people were to get away, and I want you making the arrest. There's no need for the Met to get all the glory. We're going to need Deputy Chief Chief Davis for the arrest. Arrest. <laughs> Pick her up and meet you at the airport. <laughs> Tell me all you know about Morag Gray. Well, she's a Scot, sir, from Allopool. But there's not much work up there, so she came south and went into service. She met Gray seven or eight years ago and married him, and they got a job at Maynot Hall. What? Uh, he did the garden and she cleaned the house? That's right. As well as the housework. It seems she's a cut above that sort of thing. According to her mother, more to the point, according to her employer up at the hall, she'd had a reasonable education and was quite bright. Her mother says, Grey dragged her down. Well, how old is she? What does she look like? 
Well, she'd be about mid-thirties, thin, dark hair. As well as the housework at the hall, she did some outside cleaning jobs, like she did at Kids Factory. But she only stayed there a few weeks. Then Gray got the sack from their employer at the hall. For stealing, wasn't it? Yes. Nine quid odd from their employer's wife's handbag. They had to leave the cottage. That came with the job. And they went and squatted in Myringham Old Town. But soon after that, Morag turned him out. Grace says she found out the reason for their getting the push and wouldn't go on living with a thief. Hmm, a likely story. Yeah. He says he spent the money he stole on a present for her, a gilt necklace. Oh? Maybe true, but it doesn't help much. Oh, I'm not so sure. What happened to Morag after she threw Grey out? All we know is that she told a woman in that row of houses that she's got a good job in offing and will be moving away. It's a baggage handler strike at Rio. All their planes are about 10 hours late getting here and about the same leaving. Hazel hasn't checked in yet? No. Of course, he uh, might have come here, seen the mess and gone home again. Well, he could have heard it on the radio and decided not to come out at all. It's possible. Not been featured much on the news. Of course, he might have uh, decided to change his destination entirely. We've alerted all the check-in desk and passport control. Good. Brock, let's get up to Hathol's flat. Mike, you stay here. You too, Polly. Come on, Sergeant. Come on. Didn't you say it was her mother who started the hue and cry for Morag? That's right. When she didn't get any reply to her letters. She never trusted Richard Gray, so she went straight to the police. There was a right to do when she got down here, wasn't there, sir? Hmm. Why? Well, you'll never guess. We had to get a translator. Don't tell me. She could only speak Gaelic. That's all right, sir. How did you know that? We found a book in Hathor's house. We assumed it was Angela's. Of men and angels. It's no wonder Hathor got into such a state. Come on, come on! Yep. Chief Inspector Wexford. This is Chief Inspector Lovett. Oh, yeah. What a word with Mr. Hathorne. <laughs> you were lucky there. Left last night. Last night? That's right. I heard he's rent up to tonight, but he got hold of me last night and said he decided to go, so it wasn't for me to argue, was it? You seem worried or upset. Nothing out of the way. Never what you might call pleasant. Always on about something. Grumbling, you know. Came up with him to check the inventory. I always insist on that before I give them back their deposit. Mind you, I knew there was something fishy about it. Well, I gave you that idea. Well, I've seen you before, for one thing. I could spot a copper a mile off. There's always folks watching him. I don't miss much, though. I don't say much. One of them made me laugh when he came here and said he was from the council. <laughs> and then there was that tall, thin one that was always in the car. Well, if you know so much, you know why he was being watched? Not me. Never did nothing but come and go and have his mother to tea and grass about the rent. Never brought a woman in here, did he? A woman with short fair hair. Not him. His mother and his daughter, and that's all. That's who he told me they were. Where do we go now, sir? Any news from the airport? Athol still hasn't checked in. We could try and find more our Grace, please. We've been trying to do that for months, Brock. Heathrow, by Notting Hill.
hole in there. It's worth a try. Police. I'm looking for a tall, dark man, about 45, comes in here with a younger, blonde woman. They were in here last night, name a half off. They don't give their names. There must have been a couple of hundred people in here last night. Well, they come in regular. Look, can you wait ten minutes? This crowd might have thinned out a bit by then. Gray. I arrest you on a charge of deception under the Fed Act. We should have left last night, Bob. Thank you, sir. Was she living in Notting Hill Gate? Yeah, in Pembridge Road. In a luxury flat, Hathall was paying for it. Out of the proceeds of the payroll fraud, as you guessed. Uh, theorised, Howard. Theorised. Theorised. While he was at the factory, Hathall set up at least two fictitious accounts that we know about. Probably more. Aided and abetted by Morag Gray. No. Morag Gray wouldn't be a party to fraud. She was an honest woman. So honest, she wouldn't keep a five-pound note she found on the office floor. So honest, she wouldn't stay married to a man who stole nine pounds to buy her a present. Then why did she murder Hathor's wife? She didn't. Or Ed Gray didn't kill Angela Hathor. Angela Hathor murdered more Ed Gray. Good God. But well, why should they want to kill more Ed Gray? Because she was honest. She got wind of Hathor's fraud, but she could have put him away for years. But the identification, sir, how could they hope to get away with it? Well, they did get away with it, Mike. Did any of us doubt for one moment that that body was Angela Hathol's? Hardly a soul knew her, even by sight. Mrs. Lake knew her, and her cousin, Mark Somerset. But who on earth would call them in to identify the body? No, the natural person was Angela's husband. And just in case there was any doubt, he took his mother in with him, taking care that she found the body. So Hathol was running away to Brazil with his own wife? Yes. He was mad about her. Is mad about her. Everyone told us. We just didn't believe them, that's all. And the print on the edge of the bath, that was Angela's. The L-shaped scar was the only mistake they made. Oh, and the book. It was the only thing that could connect the Hathols to Morag Gray. It's no wonder Hathol was so keen to get it back from me. He must have told Angela that Morag spoke Gaelic. Angela got in touch with her, asked her if she could help her with some research she was doing into the Celtic tongue. Morag was flattered, needed the money, and they made an arrangement to meet. And on the day, Angela drove over to my room, collected Morag, and brought her back to Berry Cottage. Morag suspected nothing. Why should she? 
She didn't know that she was entering Robert Hathol's cottage. Angela would have used a false name. Angela got her into the bedroom, probably on the pretext of throwing her over the house, and strangled her with her own gilt necklace. <laughs> then she took off her clothes and put them on the body. The same clothes, remember, that she had been wearing on the only previous occasion that her mother-in-law had seen her. Then she imprinted a few objects with Morag's fingerprints and brushed the dead girl's hair. That done, she drove to London, abandoned the car in Wood Green, and changed her looks totally, and settled down to wait until Hathol could join her. So, who planned it all? Angela planned it. Robert Hathol was under her thumb, just as he had been under his mother's and under his first wife's. But now, he was where he wanted to be. I think I probably owe you an apology, Reg. No apologies. I want to be able to remind you of this next time you disagree with me.